Thanks, Neil, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and see so many friends and colleagues that I've had uh, the good fortune to interact with over the years. Uh, my positions have always been in animal breeding and genetics, and if you're not sure what that means, genetics is the study of inheritance, and animal breeding is about using knowledge of genetics to improve animals. So that's what my interests are, improving animals. For the last five years or so, those activities have pretty well focused on genomics. So you may not even know what genomics is. It's, uh, it's a term that was uh, invented in the last 30 years or so, which refers to the branch of molecular bi biology concerned with structure, function, evolution, and mapping of genomes. And a genome is the complete set of genes present in an organism. So in the old days, when people looked at genetics, they might have studied one trait like coat color and been interested in the particular genes that influence coat color. If you're doing genomics work, you're interested in the entire genome, which means all of the 30,000 or so genes that influence performance. So a particular use of genomics is genomic prediction, which is to rank candidates based on what we know about their genome. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at their DNA and based on their DNA make some predictions about whether these particular individuals will be average, above average, or below average if we use them as a parent. So it involves creating EPDs or EBVs, depending on which country you happen to come from, exactly the same sort of concepts as we've had in the past. So I just want to remind you of those concepts here, and I hope uh, you don't mind me showing you a Brayford bull rather than a Hereford bull, but this screen does distort it a little, so if you think it's got not very good confirmation, you can blame it on, the, on either the Brahmin part of the Brayford or you can blame it on the stretch on the projector. But basically when we go back to the pre-genomics era, when we talk about, uh, about how good a sire is, we're really talking about what the performance of the progeny of that sire uh, is. So here I show a picture where I've got a particular sire and it's got a number of different offspring. And we can go out and we can measure those offspring. And again, I'm not sure if I should tell you about kilos or pounds, but I've chosen to put it in kilos. Um, those offspring will vary in weight. And they'll vary in weight because some of them will have mothers that were younger than others. Some of them will have been born earlier in the calving season than others. But if we could adjust all of those factors so all the calves were as if they were born to the same age mother, on the same day, then they would still vary hugely in performance, just like I've shown there. And this comes as a little bit of a surprise to some people, just how much variation there is in the offspring of one sire. And we know that if the trait was very highly heritable, three quarters of the variation you'd see in the whole breed would exist within the offspring of that one sire. If the trait has a lower heritability than almost perfect, the variation is even more than that. So we often have breeders that call up and say, oh, this EPD system doesn't work properly because this is a good sire and I got a bad offspring. And I'd say, well, how many offspring did you actually look at? You need to look at a big range of offspring and you can see there the sort of thing that happens. So we don't actually learn much about how good that sire is by looking at one offspring. But we can learn quite a lot about how good that sire is if we average the performance of all of those offspring. And we can use that average, like that 10 kilos there, so the average offspring of that sire was 10 kilos, we use that to provide an estimate of an EBV. And an EBV, the breeding value of the sire, is twice the progeny difference. But the EBV of that bull would not be 20 kilos, twice the the uh, offspring difference there, unless there were hundreds of offspring from the sire. Because when I see something, or when I hear something, I impose on what I see or hear a measure of belief. So if I see something fairly believable, 
then that's okay. But if I see something, if I hear a salesman say something, I shrink the information. And the statistics that some of us, like Brian Wickham and myself, were involved with for many years before genomics is all about how you take pedigree and performance records and adjust for the non-genetic effects like age of the cow and the day of calving and then how much you should shrink them. So if this bull had 75 to 100 progeny, I would shrink the estimate to 16 to 18 kilos. If he only had five or six progeny like I, he had there, his EBV would only be about five kilos. I have to see a lot more offspring before I have a higher level of belief. But if he has lots of offspring, then the EBV will be accurate. And that's not really surprising, because if we've seen thousands of offspring, and we know that's what we see on average from the offspring of that sire, it's, it just stands to reason that if we see some more offspring from that sire, we should see the same kind of values on average. We won't necessarily for one or two. So that's the basis of all of the old day stuff. What's that got to do with genetics or genomics? When I learned all about animal breeding and, and prediction and statistics, we didn't have to actually worry about, uh, about genes and DNA and those kind of things. But what I'm showing you here is a representation of a pair of chromosomes. So chromosomes are in pairs. Cattle typically have 30 pairs and one member of the pair comes from the sire and one member of the pair comes from the dam. And as Steve has told you, it's made up of a lot of base pairs, these A's and G's and T's and C's. There's about 100 million of those base pairs in an average chromosome, 100 million of them. But probably only about 1% of that chromosome represents actual genes that are expressed that form enzymes and actually turn something on or turn something off or manufacture it. The rest of it, pretty much as far as we can tell, is some kind of junk. And I would say it's probably a little bit like a newspaper. If I read a newspaper, I'm lucky if I find one to two percent that might interest me. But the stuff that's junk maybe is of interest to somebody else. So the junk things may, may do something, but it's often the genes themselves we're interested in. Okay, so what's that got to do with an EBV? Well, we've known for more than 50 years that the definition of a breeding value, how it is that one sire is better or worse than another, comes about from the sum of the effects of many genes. So what I'm showing you here on this little uh, diagram is that some of those blue genes have different forms. And the reason they have different forms is they're made of a sequence of A's and T's and C's and G's, and that chemical sequence has to be copied every time a cell uh, reproduces during growth or every time a sperm or an egg is produced. And on average, when you copy these chemical sequences, a mistake is made about every 100 base pairs. So that means when you copy a chromosome, there's about a million mistakes made. Now that would be disastrous for an organism. So there are genes that fix errors. And as the chromosome is being manufactured with these errors in it, there are other genes that come along and clean it up and fix most of them. And they fix almost all of them, but a few slip through. So if you compare the chromosome of an offspring to the pieces of the parental chromosomes it came from, there's probably two or three of those base pairs on average that were, were changed in error. So these are mistakes. Some of those mistakes may not have any impact. It's like a spelling mistake in an advertisement. You still know what it's about even though they might have spelt a word wrong. But there are other occasions where changing a letter might completely change the meaning of a sentence. So what that means is after this has been going on for many, many generations, some of these genes that I've showed there in blue can have different sequences, and Steve talked to you about the one in uh, Calpastatin, was it, or Calpain, and how that can change the tenderness. So what I'm showing you here in blue is, on the right-hand side gene, there might be one form of the gene, what we call an allele, which lifts performance by five units, 
whereas the other chromosome has a slightly different sequence inherited from the other parent that reduces performance by five units. And I've shown on the far left there uh, one polymorphism or one change in the sequence that's not a gene that still changes performance. So we do know that the things that change performance are not just in the genes, sometimes they're outside of the genes, but they still control gene expression. Now from this molecular definition, if you sum up the values of those, uh, those alleles that I've shown you along the chromosome, if you sum them all up, then that is what a breeding value is. So if you sum them up on the top chromosome, it comes to plus two. If you sum them up on the bottom chromosome, it comes to plus eight. So you think of, a, of an EBV or an EPD as being something to do with an animal, but inside it, each chromosome has actually a breeding value. And the, and the breeding value of the chromosome that came from the sire and the breeding value of the chromosome that came from the dam would be different. And if we sum up all of those across all of the chromosomes, that's the breeding value that you would see if you generate offspring, and it's the EBV you would get if you had lots of offspring off this animal. So what happens if we have a whole lot of bulls? So I show you some, I've shown you three bulls here, and they've got a, a breeding value of 10, negative 6, and 2, and you'll see they've got slightly different combinations of the alleles there. But one of the interesting things you'll see is that even a below average bull has some alleles that are above average value. And even an above average bull has some that are a below average one. So every individual has a portfolio of these effects, some above average and some below average. A better bull just has a few more of the better ones and a few less of the poorer ones. So how can we use that information? Well, when I was growing up, I, you'd read this in a textbook, but it was absolutely meaningless in terms of its application to industry. But all that changed when somebody invented some technologies to measure single nucleotide polymorphisms, or these single changes in base pairs, and do it very, very efficiently on a chip and one company in particular, a company called Illumina, invent, invented a technology that revolutionised those activities. So what I've shown you in those little blue circles would be a single nucleotide polymorphism that has been uh, put onto a chip so it can be tested. So what this particular polymorphism is, is just some change in the genome. They've looked at the sequence and they've chosen 50,000 places maybe a couple of thousand on each chromosome, and said, let's put that on a chip. And when you run the genotype on the chip, some of the animals will be reported as having two versions of the A allele, some of them will have two versions of the B allele, and some of them will be ABs. The actual test, it might be looking for the A or the C or the G or the T, but they report them as As and Bs. So if you send up a hair sample to get it tested, what you get back is these animals are either AA or BB or BB. Or AA, AB or BB, okay? So what do we do with that? Well, what we could do with that is just do regression, like simple linear regression you might have learnt in statistics. And what we would put on the y-axis up the top is the breeding value, how good the animal was, and what we'd put on the x-axis is how many copies of the B allele they have, zero, one, or two. And if we see a line that goes up or goes down, then that tells us that that particular SNP is associated with the trait that we're interested in. Now, that particular thing that's being tested is not a real gene, it's just a piece of junk. But what often happens and it, it happens sort of by chance and from the history of selection, is that that gene test is correlated with a real mutation that changes performance somewhere else along the genome. Now when we get the test back, AAAB or BB, we don't know which allele belongs on the paternal chromosome and which is on the maternal chromosome, but what I've showed you here is where that particular SNP is perfectly correlated 
with the alleles that I showed you in the left hand side. So when it's AB, it's got a negative 2 and a plus 2. When it's BB, it's got two negative 2s. And when it's AA, it's got two plus 2s. So if I saturate the genome with these SNPs, and I look at every SNP one at a time, if I find a SNP that has a big effect, it doesn't mean that SNP is the real gene. It just means it's associated with a gene, hopefully nearby. And if it's associated, like I show you here, that's what we refer to as linkage disequilibrium, or LD. And the example I show you here would be perfect LD, where there's an exact relationship between the SNP and the actual mutation that's changing the level of performance. Okay, so when I got the um, title uh, sent to me for my talk, they sort of added something in that you wanted to hear about, uh, about horns and poles and skurs. So the kind of analysis that I describe is exactly what has been done with the inheritance of horns and the inheritance of skurs and cattle. It was probably done not with SNPs, but with another kind of uh, marker, something called microsatellites. And a lot of the recent work on this was done with Sheila Smuts in the University of Saskatoon. But what her work showed was the gene that determines whether an individual is skirt or not is physically located on chromosome 19. And the gene that controls whether an animal is horned or polled is physically located right at the beginning of chromosome 1. And it's been known for a long time that the inheritance of horns is a little bit different in Bos taurus, like British and continental breeds, from Bos indicus, the eared or horned cattle. And they recognised it was a different gene and they thought it might have been somewhere else, but a group at Texas A&M has done research to show that actually maps to exactly the same position on chromosome 1 as does the British form of uh, horned or polled. So the, the conventional genetics work looking at horned and polled goes back a long time. This was a nice discrete trait and there was some very good research done on it, published right back in the 1970s from the Meat Animal Research Centre in, uh, in Nebraska. But other work's been done in Europe and in uh, Australia in particular. There are many, many publications that describe you how this inheritance works. Polled is dominant to horned. Skurs is dominant in males to not being skurred, but it's the other way around, the dominance in females. So somehow there's some interaction with the reproductive hormones. And this causes some problems. Um, skurs can't be seen, obviously, when horns are present. And the difference between a skur and a horn is a, is, uh, is a horn is growing from the skull, whereas a skur is just attached to the, to the skin itself. But in a very young animal, sometimes it might look like it's polled, but later a skur develops. So when somebody reports an individual as not being skurred, it might really be skurred, it's just that they didn't look late enough in the life of the animal. And in some very old animals that are skurred, it seems like the skur can actually attach to the horn so it looks like a horn. So the big problem we have is not one of understanding the mode of inheritance, we know that, it's a problem of classification. We can't tell what the skurred phenotype is if it's horned, and we can sometimes make mistakes between skurs and horns. Okay, so um, there's been, a, so there's been a, a, a lot of work done uh, by a number of groups, Texas A&M, Saskatoon, University of Liège, Australia, trying to find the actual mutation that causes horn polled and the actual mutation that, that that causes skurs. And to my knowledge, neither of them have been found. They find SNPs that appear to work in some of the families they've got, but then when they apply them in another breed or other families, they find they don't work. And what that means is they've got a SNP that's just in linkage disequilibrium with the real effect in their particular population, and when they apply it to some new animals, it doesn't work because the linkage disequilibrium is breaking down. So at some point in the future, somebody probably will discover those mutations, but my guess is most of the resource populations they've been using 
have one or two mistakes in the way the animals have been called as horned or polled or scurred that has made it hard for them to find those particular mutations. And it's probably also a problem on chromosome 1 at the end. It's a little bit more difficult an area to deal with and to sequence. But uh, that's really the status of it. So it hasn't changed for a number of years. People keep coming up with SNPs they think are a little bit better. And they will probably work quite well if you use them in the same breed or families that they were discovered in. OK. Now, we can do exactly the same thing to growth or carcass or reproduction or tenderness or anything else we like. But the difference there is we're not trying to find just the one place one place that affects the trait because probably there are hundreds or maybe thousands of genes affecting growth, so there's going to be hundreds or thousands of places to find. But we can do that, and we call that exercise training, which is a word that Steve Miller, Miller used. So training means I take bulls with known breeding values and known SNP genotypes, and I do the regression to find the values of each of their chromosome fragments. So from a molecular point of view, you can think of, as a, of a bull as having EBVs on little wee chromosome fragments, but what you see when you get offspring is the sum of all of them. So this is what happens when we do exactly that for birth weight, and this is an Angus, and I show you some Angus data because we had more Angus animals than anybody. But if I look at little pieces of chromosome, about 1%, about, 100, about 1 million base pair pieces, the biggest piece that affects birth weight in Angus accounts for 7% of the variation, and it's on chromosome 7, and it's between 93 and 94 million bases. And the next biggest piece is on chromosome 20, and then chromosome 13. And you see there's, three or there's four pieces there that account for more than 1%, and then there's probably a few hundred that account for a fraction of a percent. And you probably say, well, we're not here to have you tell me about Angus. This is what happened when we do the same thing in Hereford. We find that same region on chromosome 7 affects birth weight in Hereford, affects almost 6%. There's another region that didn't really appear in Angus accounts for over 8% of the variation of birth weight, and there's another one on chromosome 20, about another 8%. So if you add those three together, those three gene regions alone account for more than 20% of the variation in birth weight. And it should be no surprise that if you look at weaning weight and yearling weight and some other traits, those exact same regions affect some of those other traits, ribeye area and so on. And it raises some interesting questions. If you look at that bottom one on chromosome 14, has almost no effect on Hereford, has a moderate effect on Simmental, a huge effect on Gelfi, we actually know what that gene is. We know the exact base pair that causes that. And that particular gene was found out from a study that I started in New Zealand a number of years ago, where we crossed jerseys with Holsteins. And then we made an F2 cross, so the sires were crossbred and the dams were crossbred. And there was a huge variation in size of the offspring from Holstein size to Jersey size. And a big part of that difference was due to that gene effect on chromosome 14. And Jerseys are homozygous mostly for the small form of the gene, and Holsteins are homozygous mostly for the large form of the gene. Now, somebody published before that particular gene location was found by some collaborators in Belgium, the, the Japanese published a gene effect at that position in Wagyu. So here we have a gene was found in Wagyu affecting body weight. We saw it causing differences between Jerseys and Holsteins. The mutation's been found, but it causes variation in Simmental and Gelfi, but it's not present in Hereford. So which form have the Hereford got? Have the Hereford got the little form like jerseys or the big form like Holsteins? The percent is 0.01, so probably not every Hereford is the same. They probably actually have both forms, but almost all of them are homozygous. OK. So Iowa State University, we're interested in, uh, in research and in te teaching and extension. 
And we've been interested in genetic improvement for a long time because Dr. Lush was the first person in the world to really write a book about animal breeding. Before Dr. Lush, there were people that believed in Mendelian genetics and there were people that believed in statistics and they didn't realise they were both talking about the same thing. He wrote the first textbook in 1930 and he trained many of the animal breeders around the world. The professor that taught me in New Zealand, Massey University, was one of Dr. Lush's students, Al Ray. In Australia, Fred Morley, one of their early scientists, was a student of Dr. Lush. And probably every one of you from the countries that you represent, if you spoke to your animal breeders, you'd find that their, the animal breeder or their supervisor or their supervisor's supervisor was taught by Dr. Lush. And we want to continue that role today, so that's why as a university person, my interest is in continuing to help industry make some improvement. I also represent the Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium, which is a group of researchers and extension personnel who have had a little bit of federal funding. We don't have any funding at the moment. And our particular uh, interest there is streamlining the adoption of new technologies and helping identify new traits that might uh, be of interest for selection. So rather than just the birth, weaning, yearling, calving ease kind of traits that have often been used in the past. And genomics provides a lot of opportunities for doing these kinds of things. One of my colleagues has been working on the theory of this for about 40 years. So when the idea came that we could apply genomics to these particular uh, opportunities and use tests for selection, we recognised it was going to cost a whole lot of money to do the discovery work. And two companies, Pfizer and Mary Genity, recognised there was a business opportunity that they could pay for the genotyping, they could find these big genes, and then they could sell other people tests, because most individuals would never have enough money to do the kind of research that was required. But neither Pfizer or Mary Al knew quite how to do these kind of analyses. So they came to Iowa State, and it's interesting, the two companies were competing, but we worked independently with each of these companies to help them develop these tests based on the data they brought us. But wearing a consortium hat with industry interest, we promoted the idea that validation was important. You can do a discovery and find a gene, but you can't put your hand on your heart and sell that discovery to a, to a breeder or a commercial farmer without actually proving that it works. And in the early days, both companies did some tests with us which showed that the tests they'd invented didn't work. Now, they, they did work in the training population, but because of this linkage disequilibrium breakdown, they didn't work in new populations. And both of those companies withdrew the tests because of those discoveries and didn't go on and market them. But we felt the same kind of thing should be done with all of these genomic tests. And the genomic tests just work by adding up all of those little pieces that we find and coming up with the overall breeding value. So this shows you some results from some of the work that we helped both Igenity and Pfizer with. And the numbers that we show you here are correlations. They measure the strength of the relationship between the prediction from summing up the DNA values compared to the prediction you'd actually get if you ran a progeny test. So we would like those numbers to be 1. If those numbers are like 0.7, then those are very, very high correlations. They're accounting for 50% of the variation. So we'd really like them to be 0.7 or more. And Igenity did it with just a small number of SNPs. They only had a few hundred because they wanted the test to be cheap. Pfizer did it with 50,000. On the left-hand side, I've showed you what we've done more recently using all of the data that we had available for the Pfizer test plus additional bulls. And the correlations are higher because we have more animals available. But those correlations I'm showing you all come from independent validation. Now the business model that those companies had was to sell this test. So if you look at the box on the right, Pfizer or Mary Al were going to invest in training, 
they were going to keep secret the regions that had an effect and they were going to sell that information to somebody else. And they approached the Angus Association, who was an early adopter, thought this was a good idea, but unfortunately the business model is not one that we would really want to use today. But I'll just show you what it is there. The breeder sends the hair sample to the Angus Association. The Angus Association anonymously sends it to Mary Al or Pfizer, who did the evaluation and told the Angus Association how good they thought the animal was. And that then went into the evaluation just like a weaning weight or an ultrasound measure would. But the problem with this model is that the, the genomics company, Mary Al or Pfizer, don't know who the animal was they were genotyped. And the Angus Association does not have the genotypes on the animal that they just spent the money testing. So there is no information available from every animal tested to go back into the training population and make the predictions better. But at the time this was done, they thought they would get very good predictions from just doing this once. Now one of the things we realised very early on, we thought this test in Angus would work in Red Angus, because Red Angus and Black Angus are quite closely related, and we were pretty horrified to find there that if I show you the strength of the relationship in Red Angus, the training in Black Angus does not predict Red Angus performance. So you wouldn't expect the Angus test to work in Herefords, right? The American Hereford Association had a vision to be the preferred beef breed in the US. It had a mission to provide leadership, record, promote and facilitate production and consumption of beef. And they had a number of core strategies and those strategies involved a number of initiatives and one of them was to validate genomic predictions so they could offer them to their clients as part of their servicing. So what we were able to do through some USDA funded genotypes that had been provided to the Hereford Association is validate those Angus predictions in Hereford. We didn't expect they would work because they didn't work in Red Angus, but here's the results to show that they really don't. The best correlation we got was less than 0.2. If you square that, that's less than 0.04. So that says the the Angus prediction accounts for less than 4% of the variation in the trait in Herefords. Okay? So we did a training discovery specifically in American Herefords for American Hereford, and there are the correlations you see. So where the, the state of the art is at the moment is we have to do this training in the particular breed that we were interested in applying the test for. And the correlations are not as high as the 0.7s and so we got in Angus because we only had a little over 1,000 Herefords there and not the 3,500 Angus animals we had. Now about this time we were having discussions with a number of other Hereford associations and, and people in places like Canada and in Uruguay and in Argentina were interested in getting into genomic prediction. And so we offered them the opportunity to test some of their bulls and we would validate and see whether an, a, a US-based prediction would work in their Herefords. We knew it wouldn't go across breeds, but we thought it might go across countries. And here are the results you can see. The black column in the middle is how well the predictions worked in some Canadian bulls. Not quite as well as they worked in the American bulls. Then we looked at how well they would work in Uruguayan bulls and they dubbed, dug deeply in their pockets. They invested in 400 bulls being genotyped, which was a tremendous effort. So they now have a resource for their science team and they didn't work as well as either the US or the Canadian ones do. Then we did some testing in Argentina with the help of our Argentine colleagues and the first set of 59 bulls we got from Argentina, the correlations were virtually zero. But those particular bulls were not closely related at all to US bulls. So then they went out and got some more bulls, another 40 from herds that did have some links with the US and you can see the correlations have gone up so more. So what hopefully you're learning is these training predictions don't work across breed 
and they don't work across country either unless the country is close related to the country that the training is being done. But it does provide the opportunity for it to pull this data and perhaps develop Pan-American type predictions. So within breed prediction, reliable and close relatives if you have enough historical data, but the predictive ability erodes if the tests are applied to animals more distantly related, and the most distantly related animals you could test in would of course be animals in another breed. The American Hereford Association was interested in a different model. So their particular model, they have been investing in the 50K genotypes. They own the genotypes. They have the genotypes on all of the animals, but they are getting GeneSeq to do the genotyping. They pay for the genotyping, but they get the genotypes back. And we are developing a system where GeneSeq will actually have the prediction equation built into their system so that the breed association will be get, able to get directly from gene seq not just the genotypes, but also the genomic scores. And the prediction equation used by gene seq will be one developed with public funding at institutions such as Iowa State and presumably University of Guelph. Steve Miller will be working with us on doing the same kind of things for Canada. And the advantage of this business model is that every animal that gets tested contributes to the training and improved predictions in the future. The other thing that has to happen is since the predictions are not perfect, if the prediction is based only on DNA, it's not using all of the information from conventional evaluation. So we want to join those two together. And we do it by a process known as blending. There are a number of different methods for blending and there's still scientific debate about which one is the most appropriate. But Breed Plan, who's responsible for the Pan-American evaluation, is going to do the blending using a method called Selection Index. And here are some results to show you what the impact on accuracy would be. And it's BIF accuracy, so apologies to those of you in the rest of the world who use other measures of accuracy. But what you'll notice is, uh, is the, the black lines there are the accuracy of the animal before you do the genomic test. And the little white bar on the left shows you how much the accuracy goes up if you add the genomic test. And this graph here is for a genetic correlation of 0.3, which, accounts, which is, is, is like a test that accounts for 10% of the variation, so not a very good test. The next one shows you what would happen if the genetic correlation was 0.6, which is equivalent to a test that would account for 40% of the variation. And remember I told you for birth weight, just a few genes were counting for more than 20%. So for many of the traits, it's gonna be between these two places. And what you'll see there is that genomic testing will not improve the accuracy of an already accurate bull. There's no better way to test a bull than progeny testing in terms of accuracy. It's just expensive and time consuming. If you invest in a test on a low accuracy bull, like a calf that's just been born, then you're guaranteed the accuracy will increase. But you're not guaranteed the EBV will increase. It's equally likely to go up or go down, okay? The amount of accuracy increase will depend on the reliability of the tests. And what we're hoping is the reliability of the test will increase quite rapidly as we get more animals to use for training. So just to show you, it's not just Angus and Hereford. Here are the results for Simmental and for Limousin and for Gelpvi. And you can see quite clearly there, if you have more animals, if you have two to 3,000 animals, you get much more accurate predictions than you do if you only have around about 1,000 animals like the current American Hereford is. So more data for estimating effects will improve accuracy. So what's the best way to get more data? Well, we believe the best way is to commercialize the test and make it available to breeders. So breeders can pay for the testing of their own animals and they can recognise that every animal they test will be an investment in proving the accuracy for the whole breed. We are working on an implementation of a slightly cheaper chip 
that uses fewer SNPs, and then we use a process called imputation up to the 50K. So we're working on a number of ways to make these things better. But just to remind you again, there were a few positions that had big effects, and those same positions appeared to influence performance across a number of breeds. So we're also interested in leveraging investment in other breeds to help the prediction in Herefords. And we're doing this by sequencing. So I have at the moment about 10 Hereford bulls being sequenced. I'd hoped I'd have data to show you today, but it's probably going to be another day or two before I get the results on the first of those bulls. But what we're doing there is looking for the actual mutations in the regions that we're seeing having a big effect, and we'll compare the mutations in that regions to the ones we see in Angus and Hereford and Simmental and Limousin to hope we can find a real causal rather than just one of these markers that doesn't have high linkage disequilibrium. And we think if we do that, those better markers will work much better across country and possibly even across breeds. So our plans are to sequence to find the variants that might be responsible. And we already know there's probably at least 20 million variants that we're going to find in the sequencing of these animals. Now, we don't then want to go and re-genotype the animals that have already been done, so we're developing statistical methods called imputation that have been widely used in the human area to take the sequence data on a few bulls and predict what the genotypes would be on the bulls that have the 50K data. So if somebody invests in a 50K test on their bull, and maybe the accuracy is not as good as we like, that's not the end of the story. We'll go back and we'll get better and better predictions on that bull as we get the sequence information. As we identify better markers from having these new variants to look at, what we will be doing is working with GeneSeq to get them added to their smaller, cheaper chips. So my guess is the chip that's currently 10K in a year or two might end up being 11 or 12 or 15K. It'll gradually grow, but it will grow with new content that comes out of this discovery. OK, so summary. Genomics will increase the accuracy of evaluation. The technology is starting to mature. I don't mean it is mature. It's starting mature. It's a bit like an adolescent, right? We're going through a phase where it's changing. It works much better with greater amounts of data. And genomic prediction will get more accurate than it is today, provided we can continue to undertake the research. And we'll only be able to do that with organisations such as Hereford Associations that are prepared to invest and work with us in genotyping some of their animals. Okay, so I'd just like to acknowledge one of my postdocs who's done many of the actual analyses that I've reported here. The American Hereford breeders and board members who have seen the strategic advantages of uh, this technology and our Canadian, Uruguayan and Argentine researchers and cattlemen who have been prepared to work with us on this validation and development. Thanks very much. Sorry if I've cut into lunch a bit, Neil. So we have time for one, maybe two quick questions for Dorian. Gary McCain from Australia. It's pleasing and I acknowledge your uh, concern that uh, genetics by environment isn't a figment of some people's imagination, that it does ha should happen between countries and I applaud you for saying that on the stage because a lot of people uh, think that uh, genotype is the, the sole thing that will happen and tell us everything. My concern is where we're heading with the genotype and I, I totally believe in it. Where can we get some phenotype information that we're not heading down this one track with genotype that's going to give us all these things, but some of the phenotype that we do look for in our animals isn't going to be there because we do need walking, grazing, eating cows? Yeah, you, you, you raise a very good point, and it, I want to reiterate the comments about the horns and scurs. The problem with the, doing the discovery with horns and scurs is that we probably don't have enough 
100% reliable phenotype on horns and skurs. And exactly the same circumstance arises when we talk about any other trade. So everybody says, well, we would love to have a genomic prediction of fertility. Well, where is all the good phenotypic data on fertility? Many breed associations didn't have total herd reporting, so although they might have data going back many, many years, we don't have a data that says what happened to every cow exposed to the bull. So that means if we want to do genomic prediction of fertility traits, we need more phenotypes. If we've got genotype environment interaction, which I'm sure we do in many cases, and an animal performs differently, say, on a grass-fed operation compared to a feedlot operation, then we're not going to be able to do the training using only feedlot data. So the genomic error, it's not going to be like people used to think, which is that you'd have some litmus test that would tell you all about the animal in the absence of phenotype. We may be able to do that for coat colour and eventually for horns and skurs and so on, but for all of the other uh, productive traits moving into the future, we're really going to have a situation where you have to be phenotyping and genotyping. So breed associations have to realise it's not a matter of giving up performance recording to do genomics work, it's bringing genomics work in in addition to phenotyping. And right today, we probably have too many phenotypes internationally on birth weight, weaning weight and yearling weight, and not nearly enough phenotypes on all of the other traits that impact performance. I mentioned to you our work with Pfizer. Pfizer invested in two very big projects that were directly aimed at investing in, in phenotypes that didn't exist. And one of them was in phenotypes associated with the fatty acid composition of beef, and another one and associated with the mineral concentration of beef, with the idea that we could actually select beef to have greater quantities of iron in it, for instance, or have a fatty acid profile that would clean out your arteries. Or there's been another one invested to look at bovine respiratory disease, to so look at, at how often they get sick in the feedlot. We can't rest on our laurels. We're still working to make the predictions better for birth, weaning and yearling, but ultimately we want to make it better over a whole range of traits, and that's going to require phenotyping. Now we do have some breed associations that are working, for instance, with feed intake, doing studies with feed intake that can directly feed into the kind of studies I'm talking about. But, but important point, don't drop the ball on phenotypes. Phenotypes are critically important. I think we'll uh, end the questions there. Uh, Randy, you come up and uh, present a gift to Dorian on behalf of the Thanks, Dorian. Thanks very much. Enjoy your speech. Great. Thank you. Thank you.